wherever you go. Beloveds, how about some love for the worship team this morning? Amen, amen. Father, thank you. You have led us to this point in our gathering. Holy Spirit, you led us in song and in praise. You've spoken to us a word over us for each and every one. And there's grace in this place, sufficient grace that men and women might be saved and sanctified, dear God, and, uh, and set on the right path. The Bible says that word is a light to my path and a lamp to my feet, dear God. Light our path this morning with your word. You prepared us with worship, dear God. Now speak to our hearts. Plant this good seed in the good soil of our hearts and bring forth, dear God, trees that bear fruit in this season, some 30, some 60. My prayer in this place, the hundredfold, that each and every one of us would give back to you fully as you've given to us. Have your way. Speak through your word. Your children are listening in Jesus' name. Amen, beloveds. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Boy, it got quiet in here. Somebody must be about to preach. This is part five uh, to a uh, series that began a while ago, The King in the Kingdom, King in His Kingdom. And uh, it, foundationally, I just want to remind you that you serve a king. Amen? Amen. A heavenly king. And uh, you are his people. And everywhere he sends us, everywhere he places us, is his territory. Uh, and so that's what the kingdom means, that there's a king, that there's a people who are subject to that king, uh, willingly hope, and lovingly, hopefully. And uh, there's a territory, there's an effect. Where God sends you, there's an effect. When heavenly people come to a place, uh, there's, a, there's an effect. Things change. Did you know if God wants to change something, truly change something, that he does it through you? He sends you. He sends you. He sends you because you represent Jesus Christ. You are a picture to the world of Jesus Christ. You are a picture of the world of what happens when a man or woman believes. What happens when a family believes? What happens when a church believes and sets themselves at the feet of the Lord Jesus, receives from him, and then goes out from him doing his will, having come to the knowledge of his will? By having sat before him in worship and in praise, uh, you have decided that, that it is important to you, uh, if you're part of this family, to be in the house. That means a, a, a viable, living, giving, serving part of this local fellowship. Uh, in the word, that means daily, daily seeking God at his word. Uh, Jesus Christ, by the way, is the word of God. Amen. And, and, and you are you are you've committed yourself to conversation with God. You've committed yourself to consistently speaking and communicating with him in prayer. And I'm not even even necessarily talking about anything formal at all. Uh, I'm talking about a relationship that is uh, that, 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 that really is typified and identified by your communication with the God, the Father that you've come to love and the one that you realize who loves you. you. You speak to him. You speak to him. You keep it real with him. Somebody say, keep it real. <laughs> if you don't know how to pray, just keep it real. Tell God what it is that, that's on your heart and on your mind. Keep it real with him. Keep it, keep it uh, uh, current and keep it real. And, and so those of the kingdom are, are found committed to God's house. They're found committed to him uh, uh, in fellowship. They're, they're found committed to him in his word. And we not only read the word, uh, 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 but we plant the word deep in our hearts. And the result of that word planted deep in our hearts is the good fruit of the spirit. And, and, and we're committed to God in prayer. We're in the house. We're in the word. We're found in the closet of prayer because God says to come to him in secret and he will reward you openly. Anybody in this room like rewards? Yeah. Ah, yeah. The Lord knows what he's doing. Amen. Amen, Erica. He knows what he's doing. He knows. What he's doing. So uh, in, in, this, in, in this teaching this morning, I, I want to share with you what I believe is the sweetest grace of all when it comes to those of us. Uh, who are saved, those of us who are the children of the living God. I call it the freedom to repent. Did you know whom the Lord sets free is indeed free? Yes. Did you know that? That means in, in freedom indeed means that I'm not only free for myself, I'm free for everybody and everything around me. I'm free enough for you, I'm free enough for them, I'm free uh, tomorrow, I'll free to be free today after. I was free yesterday, I'm going to be free today. And freedom, so much freedom that freedom just, I, I cannot be bottled up. God will send me and place me wherever he wants me to do his will and it cannot be, that, that, that fountain cannot be blocked. I am 
free. I'm not trapped. I can move. I can walk. I can dance. I can lift my hands. Even physically, that's hard for me. It is, it is mine in the spirit. I am able to give God what he is worthy of. And he deserves the praise. Come on, church. He deserves the praise. He deserves the worship. He deserves for us to turn our attention to him and turn our attention to him completely and totally. And he deserves for us to listen and hear what he is saying to his church and to do accordingly. That is freedom. That is what it means to be free. I am not trapped. I am not bound. I am not blocked. I am not held back. I am free. Come on, church. I am free. You can put me in a cage and I am free. Amen. Amen. You cannot enslave a man that's free on the inside. Come on. You cannot enslave a woman that's free on the inside. They put Paul in jail and he wrote letters that changed everything. Amen. Maybe that's when he got the time. He might not have written those letters had he been gallivanting about like the apostle that he was. He might not have had a chance to sit down and think about Romans. You see, even in jail, you're free. And in jail, he was setting people free. Because when you read the book of Romans, you get set free. Come on, church. Those prison epistles, well, he was in prison and setting everybody, setting the captives free. Come on, church. That's what it means. He's setting captives free. And that's you. The more difficult it gets for you, the more effective your ministry, the sweeter the fragrance. I hope that helps somebody this morning. I hope because, because these are difficult days. Anybody here experience, experiencing difficult days? Come on, you should got a louder amen than that. I know some, I know some of y'all are going through it, and, and, and we're really truly going through it, but this is the time where God expects the glory. Amen. Come on, church. Hallelujah. That's the difference between us now and then. We were not free to give God glory from the prison before. We were just waiting to get out. I'm not saying it's a good thing to stay in prison. I'm saying, but while you're in prison, be like Joseph. Joseph was, was a model prisoner. They made him in charge of the prisoners. The inmates were certainly running the asylum when he was in there because he was so, he was so free a man that the warden himself saw the freedom in him. I said, hmm, put him in charge of all the prisoners. You're a bad man if you go to jail and they put you in charge of the prisoners. Come on, church. Hallelujah. That's how I feel about this church. <laughs> I get, a, I, get a ch I get a minute to be in charge of the prisoners, amen. Amen. We're prisoners of praise, amen. Amen. Freedom, the freedom to repent. I want you to hear this, the, the, the first sermon delivered in the church. I want you to hear these words because, because there's no sermon that, that ever is preached in a church that should really be in foundation any different than the first. I want you to hear the words that Peter spoke here in Acts 3, 12 through 21. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why it looks so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness, we had made this man walk. The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And in and his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he is thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore. Everybody say repent. Repent, repent therefore, and be converted, that your, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. And that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Woo. I feel like we should take another offering right now. <laughs> Special birthday offering. No, no, just <laughs> I digress. <laughs> I digress. My bad. My bad. <laughs> I think I need to repent. <laughs> what a message. You don't need to preach very long, do you? 
to get to the point. I don't think he missed anything that needed to be said. He told us who we were. By the way, it is right for you to find yourself in this passage. I like to line up with the apostles to be on that side. But I must admit that I am a sinner. Am I? Uh, they don't, maybe it's just a, I, I must admit. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Well, then uh, we just we'll, we'll, we'll wait on them. <laughs> I must admit that I am a sinner and, and I am the wretch in the song Amazing Grace. I am that person. So as Peter is speaking to them, he says this about them. He says, you completely misconstrued everything as it pertains to Jesus Christ. You see, it is a it is a temptation for us once we get saved to 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 forget how far off we were. It is a temptation once we are saved to save for a time to forget what wretches we were. And if we're not careful, we will be. It, 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 it is it is. It is a temptation to forget that we were saved by grace through faith and not by no works of our own. We are kept by grace through faith, no works of our own. We will get to heaven by grace through faith, no works of our own. We came in the world with nothing. We're going to leave with nothing. Trust me, I see some babies coming to the world. They didn't bring anything at all. Amen, but a bunch of need. They're like a seven-pound need. They brought nothing of value into the world. And beloved, you will take nothing of value out. Nothing material whatsoever. You didn't, couldn't do a thing for yourself, just like that baby that's delivered. Can't do a thing for themselves. Can't even breathe until the Holy Spirit touches them in their lungs and makes them breathe. They've never breathed before when they're delivered until the Holy Spirit touches them. It gives them life, up independent of their moms. That's me. He's talking to me when he says this. When he says that Pilate was determined to let him go, but I delivered him. I delivered him. But Eric, you denied him in the presence of Pilate. And Pilate was determined to let him go. And Pilate was a piece of work himself. But even Pilate knew that there was no fault in him. Hmm. But Eric, you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for murder to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life. Eric, you did that. Whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. That's where I am in this picture. That's where we have, because... What he says only makes sense in the light of repentance. Every one of us is guilty of the sin that Jesus died for on the cross. Every one of us. Therefore, no one can approach the throne of God without the repentance that Peter talks about right here in this passage. Beloved, repentance is the turning of our lives to the way, the truth, and the life that's presented to us in Jesus. Okay? Notice that the repentance Peter, Peter spoke of is rooted and grounded in the realization that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. He is the fulfillment of every prophecy. He is the fulfillment of everything, the fulfillment of the law itself. He is righteousness personified. He is the standard of God personified. He is the word of God personified. He is the son of God personified. And all of us, if we're going to come to God, must come to and through Jesus. So we must accept God we must accept God on the terms of Jesus Christ and accept Jesus on God's terms. And only the Holy Spirit reveals that. Therefore, the first thing he says to you is you must repent. He told Nicodemus, Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Being born again and repentance are the same identical thing. You must accept God on my terms. Right. What a sad thing. So many Christians believe we're Christians because we're right about stuff. And if I'm a Christian, I'll feel this way. And if I'm a Christian, I'll oppose that. If I'm a Christian, I'll promote that. If I'm a Christian, I'll go here and I'll hang out with all those Christians. And if I'm a Christian, then I do this on Saturday. On a Christian, I don't do that on Tuesday. On a Christian, if I'm a Christian, I really do this this many times a month. If I'm a Christian, I really, and this, what a sad thing to come to God on any other terms than Jesus Christ. Amen. Peter did not present anything else but Jesus Christ. He didn't present prosperity. He didn't present healing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to heal some people in the room right now. There is no such thing as a healing ministry. Oh, there is no such. Th <laughs> they got stumped again. <coughs> there is no such thing as a healing evangelist. There is no such thing. 
It does not exist. The Lord did not send the apostles to preach healing. He sent them to preach Christ and him crucified. Come on, church. We put the cart before the horse. And, and we, we worship the effect when Jesus is the cause. If Jesus is in the room, by the way, somebody's going to get healed. Come on, church. There's no deliverance ministry. God didn't send people around to deliver stuff. That folks going around conjuring up devils. They conjure them up. You know, it's a straw man. You bring them up or you knock them down. You bring them up or you knock them down. You bring them up or you knock them down. There's no deliverance ministry. It's just not in the scriptures. No way. But everywhere that people were filled with the spirit went, folks got delivered. Come on, church. If you are called, you're called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're not called to preach prosperity. Everywhere the gospel goes, people are blessed. And God is magnified. You are called to preach the gospel. You must be born again. And then once you're born again, you need to act like it. Amen. Come on, church. You need to act like it. There's a way that a, a born-again man, a born-again woman acts. Now, we're not perfect. We make a mistake every now and then. Come on, church. Am I in the right church? Every now and then, you blow it. You say something you shouldn't have said. You do something you shouldn't have done. Every now and then, you put something in the sermon you shouldn't have put in there. But, but y'all keep coming back, so it must be all right. Hallelujah. Every one of us... The gift of repentance is the gift that keeps on giving. And it is a gift. It is a gift. Repentance is not a place we can come to on our own. Amen. Because repentance has everything to do with relationship. Okay? It's a divine gift offered by God alone, the one who has come to, to the one who has come to him in sincerity and in Christ. It is a spirit spiritual transaction. It is a spiritual work that is found beyond sorrow, beyond the realization of sin or the admission of guilt, beyond my efforts toward restitutional recovery or tearful expressions of regret. Amen. Let me say this, beloveds, and I want to differentiate repentance from every single thing, every other thing. Repentance is necessary because of sin. Amen. Amen. The one thing that is going to keep people out of the presence of God forever is sin. Nothing else. It's not complicated. Jesus came and died for our sins. Adam, when you eat of the fruit of that tree, that is a sin, and you will die. Jesus came that we might live forever. So we had to deal with that, which is the, the, the man killer. And that's sin transgression against the, the, the known or even ignorance of the will of God. Sin. Yes, sir. And Jesus came to deal with that and that alone because that and that alone is what separates us from God. Amen. God made us for fellowship. He made us to be with him. And we chose another route. We chose to do our thing. Is anybody in this room that has, hasn't at one point in their life chosen to do their thing? Each and every one of us has chosen. And not only that, even once we were saved, there's at least once or twice. <laughs> at least once or twice that we kind of did our own thing and got a little, at least once or twice. So repentance is not a one-time deal. Repentance is a gift that keeps on giving because if you know me and I know you, we need it. Yes. And we need it daily. We might need it at any moment now. Yes. Yes. Amen. And it's a wonderful thing to know that Jesus is there he himself is the path. We don't have to get on the path. Jesus is the path. And if we're in him and he is in us, we are on the path. Okay, nothing that I do gets me on the path. Everything that he did gets and keeps me on the path. And repentance is a constant turning away from myself and turning to him until I realize that it is who I am. A repentant, repentance is not something that I do. It's somebody that I am. I am saved. I am born again. And being born again and repentance are the same thing. It is how I live. I am constantly daily turning from myself to him. I'm constantly saying no to the darkness and yes to the light. I'm constantly moderating my behavior and my speech. Why? Because it, it, in relation to you, because the Bible says that love does no harm to its neighbor. Repentance gets me back on the path of love. It keeps me on the path of love. It teaches me what love really truly means. Some people think they love you, but that's not love. That's their version of love. The Bible says God so loved the world 
world that he gave his only begotten son. That's God's version of love, that whoever believe on him will not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible says God is love. And if you want to know how God looks and how love looks and how love acts, well, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. That's what love is in real time. And if you're going to love in real time, it is going to look like Jesus. Come on, church. Repentance is turning away from my version of anything. My version of everything. Repentance is hearing you, hearing the heart of what you say and not even, not simply the words. If I am to understand my wife, which I don't, I am going to have to hear her with the ears of my heart. Amen? Amen? Amen. Not the ears on the side of my head, but the ears of my heart. I have to repent today because yesterday she asked me to put up Christmas lights. I don't want to put up Christmas lights. (laughs) And I told her I don't want to put up Christmas lights. (laughs) This is personal. So, brothers, I'm sorry, because all of you that the wife has put up Christmas lights, and you've been dragging your feet, I'm, 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 and now I'm putting us all on Front Street today. And it's not about the Christmas lights. <laughs> it's not about this. It's something more. It's a, it's a point of understanding. I need to understand if I want to live in peace, we need Christmas lights. <laughs> and the Lord's looking at me and says, is that really that hard? Well, yeah, because I don't want them, Lord. So anyways, I just want to let you know it's very practical. <laughs> this, 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 this teaching is it's very practical. It comes to where you live and the conversations you're having and the relationships you're in. And maybe it's ma- a simple matter is Christmas lights. Every point of repentance is not from hell to heaven. Some of it just from no Christmas lights to Christmas lights. So come on, church. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's a gift of God that turns us back. To him. It, it is far beyond sorrow. I'm sorry, that's what I meant to talk about there. I just got caught on Christmas lights. I'm sorry. <laughs> it, <laughs> it is far, repentance is far beyond anything else. Once you and I realize that we've done something wrong, okay, let's, let's put us all in that place. We realize that oh, we sinned. Or, or, or we've been insensitive, or we've just done something wrong, or something we ought not to have done. What's our response? Naturally speaking, our response is, I mean, and, and we respond properly. Naturally speaking, our response is we're sorry. We apologize is, is, is when we need to. Um, we sometimes have to make restitution. We have to go back and clean, clean that up. You know, at different times, we, um, Sometimes we find ourselves in all kinds of, of behaviors and that, that, that from which we need to extricate ourselves and, and we need to recover because we have lost, uh, we've given away some of ourselves that we need to recover. There's recovery, there's, there, there's true sorrow, there's tears, and there's even begging the other person for forgiveness and, and there's trying to do better. And while that is all good and wonderful, it all falls short of repentance. None of it meets God's requirement. None of it. You see, before Peter spoke to them of repentance, he spoke to them of relationship. This is who God is. He sent his son. His son died for your sins. His son made a way for you to get to him and to be with him. There is no other way. You must come to the Father through him. Relationship. Relationship. And so he says, repent and turn to what God has offered. And when you turn to what God has offered, you turn to a man. You don't turn to necessarily a behavior. You turn to a man. You turn to a person. And when you turn to that person, trust me, you get to the person, your behavior will be altered in a good way. When you get to Jesus, when you get the Holy Spirit inside of you, he will alter your behavior, not you. Because there's nothing you can do to make up for the sin that you have committed. There's nothing you can do. Why is that, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. And and, and I'll show you this way. In in the 51st Psalm, which is a psalm of repentance, a psalm of brokenness, a psalm of confession, 
The whole thing, conviction, confession, repentance. Conviction, yes, Lord, I agree with you. Confession, homologeo, saying the same thing, the same word, agreeing with God, saying the same thing about my sin that God says about it. By the way, you got to get to confession first because you have to say about what you, you're saying the same thing God says about it. And God didn't say it wasn't all that bad. Sometimes that's what we think it wasn't all that bad. My sin wasn't bad as George's sin. We don't say that with our mouth sometimes, but that's the way we act. Like our sins aren't quite as bad as those. Our Christian sins aren't as bad as Muslim sins. Mm -mm, no, no, those, their sins are really, really bad. They're the real enemies of God. Be careful. Take care. Take care there that you don't throw a whole bunch of people under the bus that God is bringing to deliverance. Be careful. So, so it, it, it's more than, 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 than I, he, David says this. He says, Lord, because you may know that, that he got confronted by Nathan because David, when he should have been busy being the king that he's called to be, he was hanging out at the house watching the Lakers or something. And, 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 and he got up and he, and he went out. He's just chilling. And, and, you know, and he had his beer in his, his one hand. He's just chilling. Should have been out with his troops doing what they do. And, he, you know, he's got his grog and, and he looks out. And, he, and, you know, he has the highest building, and, and, and he looked over, and he saw a woman bathing uh, a couple blocks away. And he was, he was stunned. A naked body will do that for you sometimes. And he called her. He, he's a king. He summoned her to his, to his home, and, and he whined and dined or whatever he needed to do and got involved with her sexually. And, and sent her home as if nothing had ever happened, found out she was pregnant. Well, she was pregnant with his baby because her husband was out doing what he was supposed to do, fighting for David. And uh, you know the story. If, if you don't, it is, it's worth reading. And uh, David ended up plotting to have her husband killed, which he did, and took her to himself and, and went on like forgot about it. Like, like what? I'm the king. What? Huh. Forgot about it until Nathan came. And put that crooked finger just like that. You see, the prophets don't have straight fingers. That's how you know it's a prophet. The fingers are like this. Kind of wrap around your neck, you know, when they talk to you. You that crooked finger. Now it's crooked. It's still pointing at you, though. They know exactly how to point that thing. And he told them, say, you, man, you, you are the one that you would condemn. He told him a story and about something that happened with some neighbors, and, and David said, oh, that was so wrong. That person needs to be put to death. He said, you're the one I'm talking about. You stole your neighbor's wife. You could have any woman you want. You got a harem. You got a harem. Come on. You say, come on, man. Come on, man. <laughs> Takes this man's wife, puts him to death, and the man was serving him. Hmm. It's a dangerous thing to look at David and think the scripture's not talking about you and me. Here's what David said in his repentance. One of the things he said in Psalm 51, he said, Lord, against you and only you have I sinned. And every time I read that, I go, wait a minute, David, that's not true. Yeah, you sinned against God, but you sinned against Uriah. You sinned against Joab, who you made put Uriah up front so he can get killed. You, you sinned against Bathsheba. You took her from her husband. She was minding her own business, and, and, and then you complicated her life. The child that you and uh, that she got impregnated with, impregnated with died because of you, David. No, you sinned against a lot of people. And Nathan said, you have caused the nations around to blaspheme the name of my God. Because of your behavior, because they're looking at you going like, hmm, your God's no better than ours. <laughs> look at Luke. He's, aren't you the sweet psalmist of Israel? Aren't you the, the, the great king who will one day be called, Jesus will be called the son of David? Aren't you? And so the rest of the world looks at that and says, David, no better. You Christians, no better than the rest of us. They're right. But he said, against you and only you have I sinned. Wait a minute, David, that's not true. But yes, it is true when you see it in the spirit. You see, every sin is an affront, a transgression, a violation of the word of God. Yes. What makes it a sin, that's what makes it a sin is it violates or transgresses God himself. Not that it transgressed a person, but in order to transgress a person, do poorly by a person, you had to first do poorly by God who told you what love is and what the expectation is. 
So you're violating his standard by his dealings with Bathsheba and Uriah and Joab and everyone else. He violated God. And beloved, this is what repentance means. Repentance means being right with God. When you're right with God, you do fine with men. But you can recover and you can be sorry and you can be deeply, deeply regretful and still not having repented. Because your repentance has to do with your relationship. In other words, if you are not saved, if you are not walking with God, if you're not born again, you cannot repent. Repentance is a gift to God's children. God's children only. You can be sorry. You can change up. You can do 12 steps. You can do however many you want. But you can't repent. Recovery is not repentance. Being sorry is not repentance. Paying back is not repentance. Amends, making amends is not repentance. Repentance is coming to God on his terms, and his terms has a name, Jesus. So against you, God, and only you have I sinned. So if I'm walking with God and determined not to sin against God, the people around me don't have to worry. They don't have to worry. Jesus says, what are the two great commandments? Love, God. With all your mind, soul, heart, strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And love does no harm to his neighbor. So if we love God, if we are pointed rightly toward Jesus Christ, we will love and love will do no harm to his neighbor. None. Because why? Because we're trying to do right by our neighbor? No, because we're doing right by God. And if I'm right by God and paying attention to that, I will do right by my neighbor. It's a divine gift, beloveds. And it is a gift that is ours through relationship. So don't set out to repent. Repentance is yours when you're in Christ. Be found in him. Be found in him. All of our efforts to get right and to do right before God will fall short. I, 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 I share with the, in the pre-service meeting that I don't get invited some places anymore. One of the many is uh, recovery meetings. You know, AA, Al-Anon, whatever, uh, NA. Um, and God bless them. This is no, I have no problem with any route that anyone takes. But here's what I will say to you. The reason they don't invite me is because there's no recovery ministry in the Bible. And if you invite me, you, you want to hear Bible, right? That's what I think. I, they wanted to until they heard it. And I have to challenge some very basic things that he didn't say recover. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. He didn't say recover. The days of refreshing might flow. He said repent. You see, here's why. You can recover without Jesus. You can do the 12 steps, and, and you can praise the God of your own understanding. By the way, if you understand them, he ain't God. <laughs> and you can do that. And, and, and for some people, it's a great turn. It is a beginning of something, but not the end of anything. Because the recovery becomes your God. And, and here's how it works. You know, you have the 12 steps. And I remember a friend, a very good friend of mine, uh, was very sincere and was walking very, uh, uh, very well in his recovery. And uh, he was at the, the step called amends. And amends has to do with making amends with all the people, every single one that you can name, everyone that comes to your memory, every, you write them down, every single person that your addiction, your sin affected. Everybody. And if you're an addict, that's pretty much everybody. OK, it's everybody. It's just your, your whole entire life is, 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 is colored by your addiction. Everything, every relationship, every conversation. So you got work to do. And if it, 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 to the degree that you're able, you are to go to every single person and speak to them personally and have an eye to eye, face to face conversation. Those that you can't, you have to get them on the phone. Those who, who are in other countries, you have to write them letters, you have to do whatever it takes. If they have passed away and you can get to their grave site, you have to go to their grave site. Now, my friend um, was able to really work this out. He's financially able. His career w w was such that he could get, he could actually do this. He could travel across the country and go to the graveyard and stand at that stone 
and, and apologize to that person. And he did it. He was very, very sincere. And, 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 and I watched it, and it was wonderful, and it was good. And for him, it was recovery. But, beloved, it is not repentance. He was doing all that without Jesus Christ, without a relationship with the Savior. You see, you cannot unring the bell when it comes to your sin. Okay? You punch a hole in that wall, you cannot, you cannot put a, a, a new cloth on that, on that pattern that you just tore, on that, and you put a new cloth on it. The Bible says nobody does that. Jesus says nobody does that. Why? Because it doesn't work. If, if I wore this two, two years and I, and, I, and, I, and I rip a hole in it and I put this new material in there, nobody, that's what it's like. It's like trying to put new material in, in a garment where you've ripped a hole and the garment's five years old and you wore it every day. It's not going to work. It's like putting new wine in old wine skins. I, I, I'm, I'm just this new life that I have. That I, I'm, re, I'm recovering, and you're trying to go back and pour it in. A, the old wine skins can't handle it. Repentance is the new life flowing from those who have new life, from those who are born again. Those who are born again turn away from the darkness and walk in the light. Not only you walk in the light, you are the light. Jesus says you are the light of the world. If the lights don't light up, it's going to be a dark world around here. So it is incumbent upon you in every situation when God sends you, he wants light in the place lest he wouldn't have sent you. You think you got that job so you could get a check. God can give you a check from anywhere he wants. He put you in that job because he wants light. He put you in that job because the people that you work with need to see a witness. He put you in that classroom because Lord knows those children need somebody to pray for. He put you in that family. We don't have enough time. But he put you in that family, he put some of those family members around you. The question is, the question is, when they look at you, will they see light? Will they see you walking in repentance? Not as something that you do, but somebody that you are. You see, because repentance is not for your sin, the sins that you commit. God does not forgive you for the sins that you commit. He forgives you for the sinner who you are. We sin because we are sinners. Sin is, sin is not just something that's over there and every now and then we go and grab it. Mm -mm. It rises up from in here. It rises up from the inside. Now the Lord has come to fill you with the Holy Spirit and to come to drive all of that out of you. Kind of yeah. drive every other mindset out of you and replace it with Jesus. So to sit Jesus on the throne and he scatters the enemy. Come on church, he scatters the enemy from within. Let's not expect God to do things in America that he has not done in you. Oh, yeah. no, Lord, make this a righteous nation. Make this a righteous nation. Start in the mirror. Start with the man in the mirror. That's how God makes a nation or people or block or household righteous. With the man in the mirror. What good does it do to God to save the neighborhood? And don't save the individuals in it. God works from here out. He doesn't work from out in. He works from here out. Peter was speaking to their hearts. The Bible says the word cut them to their hearts. So, hmm. repentance. When we realize we've sinned or failed or done wrong, that's not the measuring up to repentance. It's a gift. Once we've received the conviction and correction he offers, we've humbled ourselves and confessed, turned back to him, received his forgiveness and cleansing, and begun to walk in the light that he shines through us. That alone is repentance. When we begin to live the gospel, it's not just something on our lips. It's not something, not a post that we make. It's the life that we live. That is repentance. Because that's not the life I was living before Christ came and sat on the throne of my heart. 
The life that you're living now is different than the life that you ever lived, and it continues to be different. You get stranger and stranger as you live. And I don't mean strange in a weird sense that we go around trying to be strange Christians. There are enough people doing that. There are enough people doing strange things, saying strange things, and talking about God as if they know him and they don't. There's enough of that. Well-known names, people that you know, people that you've seen, people that you hear their name go, oh, he's a God. Nah. There's enough of that. What I'm talking about is when a man, when a woman makes up their mind that Jesus is Lord and King, everything changes. Everything changes. Everything within them and how they perceive everything outside changes. God is changing you. Let him have his way. God is pulling you from where you were to where he is. God is taking your eyes from where you've been to where you're going. Everything that God has for you is in front of you. You don't need to go back and get people's permission from your past to do what's in your future. Come on, church. When God sends you forward to do anything, he does not send you with a resume. Amen. He doesn't send you with an application either. When God sends you forward, he sends you with authority. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. He sends you with authority. And we walk in that authority. Leave me and act like you have what you just asked Amen. me for. If we, being evil, know how to do good things for our kids, how to pave a way for our kids, how to make a way for our kids, how to support our kids, how much more? The Father in heaven, when you turn to him, when you repent, and you turn to him as a lifestyle, this is just what I do. What are you doing today? I'm turning to Jesus. What are you doing? <laughs> Beloved, you and I can't do enough to make up for the wrong we've done. Can we agree with that? Okay, we cannot earn a place at the table in God's kingdom. Can I get agreement there? Nothing of true spiritual value can be bought, sold, or bargained for, and we bring nothing to God that adds a bit of value to him at all. Can you get, can you say amen? amen. Okay. We have no righteousness or goodness of our own that, 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 that might enrich heaven, and the church does not become any more pleasing to God because we arrived on the scene. Everybody's looking for a perfect church? Well, when you walk in, guess what? Amen. amen. Does a church become a sweeter place because you're there? That is the question. If you're repentant, it does. Our gifts, our talents, by the way, were all given to us. And we brought nothing into this world, and surely we're going to take nothing out. On, the only gracious thing we bring to the Lord is a willingness to repent. That's the only grace that we have to give to God, to turn from ourselves and the world to God to fall on our knees, to look up to heaven, to receive the free gift of salvation and forgiveness for our sins, and to receive and enjoy times of refreshing that he offers when we turn to him Hallelujah. in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So I'm going to finish with these points, beloved. Let us turn from the need of man's approval Father, forgive us for being man-pleasers. Amen? Amen? You know, there are many, many, many people who will tell you what it means to be a Christian and who will say, if you're a Christian, you feel like this or you think like this or you believe this or you vote like this or you, or you hang with them. They're, they're everywhere. But we'll end up pleasing men and displeasing God every time. Every time we, we ourselves or we let anybody define what righteousness looks like for us, righteousness looks like Jesus. Yeah. And, and, you know, God did everything that it took to keep that very, very simple. Righteousness looks like Christ. What is the work we're called to do? We're called to believe on the one whom the Father sent. <laughs> and that's a full-time job. Because everything around us wants us to commiserate with and pamper our own flesh. Everything around us wants us to commiserate with and agree with those who think like we do, look like us, act like us, talk like us, go to the same church. 
feel like we feel. That's a great temptation. But repentance turns us from the need of God's approval and the only approval that we're seeking and looking for is His. Am I obedient to His word? Am I obedient to His word? Am I in the house of God? Am I in the closet of prayer? Am I paying attention to his word? The psalmist says in Psalm 119, Lord God, I beg for your word. I beg for it. It is the air I breathe. Let us turn from our busyness to the business of the kingdom. Each, each and every one of us is going to be tempted to be a busy Christian. And we think that, that we're really, really, really serving God and his purposes by being busy, by being among the saints all the time and being at this conference and this seminar and being and speaking at this and singing at that and playing it and attending that. Oh, and this prophets are coming to do this. Oh, and the apostles are doing that. Oh, and this preachers are doing this. Oh, and we have a convocation here, there. Do what God's, as, God, as God leads. Be involved with the life of the church. But, but activity and life are two different things. Activity derives from me. Life is out from Jesus. I have come to give you life, and that more abundant. Not only does God give you life, he gives you life that overflows your borders. He gives you life that escapes you. You can't keep it in. You can't stop talking about Jesus. You can't stop serving and praising. You can't stop singing either. You always want to be in the house of God. When the door's open, there you are. Why? Because you have nothing else to do? No, you, you have... You, you have chosen to do this. You've chosen to be among God's people. Why? Because God does marvelous things among his people he will not do anywhere else. I turn from my busyness. There's plenty to do. There's plenty of places to be. There's plenty of places to be to do myself. But I have made the commitment to be in this house with this people doing what God is doing here and nowhere else. And I trust God. I trust him for his will to be done for this season, for this purpose. Turn away from my own busyness, my own decisions, and turn to God for his. I turn away from fretting and complaining and murmuring and blaming God and others and take responsibility. Repentance takes responsibility. It's not always somebody else's fault. In fact, most times it's not somebody else's fault. And even if it is somebody else's fault, God is not, he, he already knows that you're not informing him one bit. When you tell him what he did or what she did not do and what they didn't help you with and why you're here because they did and she did and he didn't and, and they, they, God knows. I'm not, I'm not trying to make something trivial out of it. I'm just saying God already knows. And it may not be your fault, but this life and all of it is your responsibility. Each and every one of us has things in our life that were not our fault, that were wrong, that maybe is wrong. And God's not going to remove it. There's some of us who pray for healing and you're still sick. There's some of us who pray for God to take the pain out and it still hurts. There's some of us who pray that relationship will be restored and you're still estranged. There's some of us who pray for our relatives to get saved. They're still heathens. It's not your fault. But dealing with it well is your responsibility. You and I are going to give an account for how we deal with the life that God sets before us, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Anybody can do well with good stuff. Anybody can rebuke the bad stuff. But it's the stuff that, that, that's something less than God's best that God trusts us with. And repentance gives you and me a healthy outlook according to the reality that God has trusted us with. It's not your fault. But it is a life God gave you. Deal with it well. Turn to Jesus. Repent. Let us turn to the word of God as a priority of our lives. The word of God, beloved, is pure power. 
It is the water of life, the bread of life. It is Jesus himself. The word of God, you, you, if you have a casual relationship with the word of God, you have a casual relationship with God. If you have a spotty relationship with the word of God, you have a spotty relationship with God. Let us turn from unhealthy, undisciplined, and unholy activities and relationships. That is repentance. Turning from them. Turning from them. And give absolutely nothing or no one power over your body but the Lord. I cleared out the church one time. I didn't mean to clear it out. I just had to say something and, and, and it chased the, half the men right out the door. <laughs> I don't think I should say it now. <laughs> I get. <laughs> I was really grieved one Sunday morning because of how slow and difficult it was to get the people even into worship. To get the men in particular to lift their hands, and I looked at them and. And I mean, sometimes the worship team is up there and we're just getting it for Jesus. We're like, <laughs> and, and, and you know, some churches, you know, they're out there drinking coffee. Most of them, they're drinking coffee. You notice we don't have a coffee bar? Because you need these hands up in here. You got to have something to clap. Got to have something to raise. And not this while you're holding your latte. Get your latte on the way home. If you get on the way to church, leave it in the car. Because you need both hands in this place. I told the men, you can't lift hands you masturbate with. It didn't come out of clear blue sky. I kind of led up to it. <laughs> you can't lift hands you sin with. If you're so busy pleasuring yourself, if you're so busy serving yourself, you have nothing to lift to God. <laughs> Repent! Amen. Oh, it's so hard. I know it's hard. But if it's not hard, it's not going to help you very much. I can't think of anything that is any good that isn't hard. Jesus Christ died for that sin. He died for it. Don't you make excuses for it. For your flesh. Don't stop pampering your flesh. Men, you okay? You survived that? You all right? Okay, see you next Sunday, Wednesday. Okay, all right. <laughs> Because a lot of those brothers never made it back. <laughs> and that's the truth. <laughs> but that was God's intention because God doesn't want you to fall short of repentance. Let us turn from the need to have our way. Woo! I should have started out with that. <laughs> Let us repent, turn from the need to have our way to be right to get what we want to do what we want to do what we think we ought to do and then to try to make it the will of God Jesus says my sheep know my voice they will not follow another who are you following Who are your children follow? Who are, you, who are, you? are they following themselves? Are you, are you so busy trying to get what you want the way you think that, you, that you're just going to follow all, wherever you need to go to get what it is that you feel that you think is right or, or whatever? It, that's what we do as Christians. We do. We, we have our own way. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. death. That's why Jesus says he is the way. He is the truth, and he is the life, because other than that, I will follow my own way. And I'll slap some verses and, and chapters on it just to feel good about myself. 
But it's not. Remember what the Lord said to Peter. One of the last things he said to him. He said, up until this point in your life, you've gone where you wanted to go. But there's going to come a day when uh, uh, somebody's going to take your belt and they're going to lead you in a way you don't want to go. In other words, your ministry, it, it, the, at the end of the day, it's not going to end up the way you think it's going to end up. You're going to serve me, but it's still, at the end of the day, it's not going to end up serving you and your purpose. It's going to serve mine. And my purposes sometimes look real weird to you. But if you trust me, I'll lead you on the path of righteousness. If you trust me, I'll lead you. Let's turn from the way, from the need to have our own way. Finally, beloveds, let's turn our lives and cares back to Jesus. How many of you know there's a lot to care about out there? There's a lot to be upset about. A lot to cry about. A lot to be heard about. A lot to worry about. There really is. And those things will crowd out Jesus every time. Every time. But let me ask you something. Are you willing to submit your life to God so that the waters that you issue will be pure? That they will be free of agenda? I know you're a Christian and you probably think your agenda is Jesus' agenda. If you have any agenda at all, it's not Jesus' agenda because he doesn't have an agenda. There's the will of God. If there's an agenda, that's what it is. God is after something deeper than any of us knows, and that needs to be okay with you. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow, I will fear no evil. I will follow you. You lead me, Lord. You lead me. The repentant man and woman is a Psalm 23 man and woman. That is you. That's what we, you didn't, you probably didn't ever read the 23rd Psalm as, as, as a chapter on repentance. But that's what it is. I was once my own shepherd, but the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters. I lead myself all kinds of places. People lead me all kinds. He leads me beside still waters. He leads me in green pastures. See, he restores my soul. He's my restorer. He's my recovery. He leads me in paths of righteousness. He's leading me in the paths I'm taking. And sometimes he leads me in a way that is even through the valley of the shadow of death, and I'm there going like, I thought I was following Jesus. How did I get here? But he's God even in the midst of the darkness. Then he seats me at the table. The great thing about the table of God is I know sometimes we think of a, a, a big dinner, ta dinner table with all of us saints. And there's going to be like more of us than we can count. And we, that, that there's going to be some long gods up there and then some of us are way back there and we're fighting for a seat close. But that's a natural way of looking at the table. He's speaking spirit. You're seated in heavenly places with him. There are no cheap seats in heaven. Amen. He prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. It doesn't say he's going to remove your enemies. It says he's going to prepare a table before you with them standing there. So they too can see that your God is good. Come on, church. In the presence of my enemies. Think about it. When you were walking uh, in a way that, 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 was, that was in opposition to God, you saw somebody that was sitting in the presence of the Lord, and you stood back and looked and were like, wow. As long as the church is in the earth, God is still saving evil people, by the way. Saved you. He's still saving the wicked. They accused Jesus of eating with the wicked, didn't they? Guess what? He was. The sick need a savior. You anoint my head with oil. Hmm. Beloved, you are the anointed of God. You are his prophets. In other words, he speaks through you. You are his anointed. Anointed people aren't some special class of Christians. 
who give themselves special names. You are the anointed of God. Amen. Amen. My cup runs over, y'all. I got enough of me and for you. Yes. Amen. Amen. I got enough of me and the people I love. Yes. Come on, church. That's repentance. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me everywhere I go. You know why you need mercy? Because of sin. You don't need mercy if there's no sin. If, if, if you didn't deserve judgment, you wouldn't need mercy. So why do saved people need mercy? <laughs> you didn't think about that, did you? Oh, Lord, be merciful to me. Well, why? Because you sinned. That's why. And that's why you can still pray that prayer. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me because I need it. And it will bring me to repentance. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. You looking for Jesus? You looking for me? You got to find Jesus. Amen? You looking for me? You got to find the house of God. You got to find the people of God. You got to find the praises of God. You got to find the work of God. Because he's led me to his house. Amen, beloveds? Amen. Do not fall short of repentance. Whatever you do, don't fall short of repentance. No matter what your effort, God is not impressed. Don't try to impress him. God's impressed with one person, and his name is Jesus. And Jesus is impressed with one thing, and it's faith. Amen. The only thing Jesus marveled at when he was on earth was faith and unbelief. That's the only thing that took him aback. Whoa, I've never seen faith like this, not even in Israel. Whoa, somebody touched my garment, power left me. Whoa, whoa. Oh, oh, whoa. He believed and, 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 and go home and your servant is fine. Amen. Whoa, faith. The only thing that impresses God, believing in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Turn to him, beloved, and never, ever turn away again. Rise up right where you are. Uh, I, you know, I love the song so good to me, and, and uh, one of the things it says is, pick me up and turn me around and place my feet on solid ground. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. There's a picture for you. Pick me up. Turn me 180. And that 180 is my repentance. That's what I walk in. That's what I live in. That's what I talk in. Even my hopes and dreams are subject to repentance. Amen. Amen. Beloved, God is before you. Keep him that way. Keep yourself pointing toward Jesus Christ. He will ever be there for you, with you, and in you if you trust him. Amen. Amen. Bow your heads with me. Father, in Jesus' name, there's grace all over this place. There's grace all over this word. There's health and hope and strength, dear God, as we magnify your name and give you the glory you deserve. Dear God, there, there, is, there is a move in this place, and it is the flow of the river of God. And we are in that river. We're planted by that river, dear God. We, we, we derive our life and holiness from the flow of the river that comes from your throne. Thank you. Dear God, we will not be moved. We are settled in the will of God, in the ways of God, at the feet of the Son of God. Be magnified, dear God. Have your way with this people. And if anyone had any doubt that there is a living God, may they know so when they meet this people. If anyone who doubts that God still speaks when they hear us speak, may they know that he's speaking. And Father God, until we meet again, may we be at peace with every man and woman as much as it has to do with us. May we give our lives fully a living sacrifice, which is but our reasonable service. Thank you for transforming and renewing our minds, conforming us to the word and the will of God. Father, I love this people, and I give them to you, place them at your feet, everything that they care about, at the feet of Jesus Christ. Until we meet again, may we give you joy in Jesus' name. 
Amen. 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 God bless you, beloved. You've been blessed. You've been blessed. Act like it.